Welcome everyone uh, to Trent Talks, our free online learning series where each week we bring together different experts to share knowledge that provide support and bring optimism to our communities during this new COVID-19 era. I'm Stephen Stone, Chancellor of Trent University here in Peterborough, Canada, and also a proud Trent alumnus. In the coming weeks, we'll cover a variety of topics such as homeschooling, managing mental health and supporting family dynamics in close quarters. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Trent professors, Dr. Craig Brunetti and Dr. Kirsten Woodend, who will be discussing what COVID-19 is and what our communities can expect to see over the coming weeks and months. Professor Brunetti is the Dean of Trent's School of Graduate Studies and an Associate Professor in Biology. He's a virologist whose research focuses on molecular virology and viral pathogenesis. I don't know what pathogenesis is. It sounds like a progressive rock group in the 1980s, but we'll find out. Professor Wooden is the Dean of Trent Fleming's School of Nursing. She's an epidemiologist who studies health issues like chronic disease management and health systems. Before we begin, it's important though to first respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisaugig Anishinaabeg. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and relations. May we honor those teachings today. Welcome, Craig and Kirsten, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, let's start by asking you, Craig, um, could you share just a, a little bit to help us with context about viruses in general and COVID-19 in particular? Sure, thanks, happy to do that. Uh, uh, first, I'll share with you a, a pet peeve I have. Um, as a virologist, uh, around the name of the virus, uh, when you read news stories or, or, or see uh, COVID-19 talked about, you might assume that the virus that causes the disease is actually COVID-19. In fact, that's not the case. COVID-19 is the name given by the World Health, World Health Organization for the disease caused by the novel coronavirus, which is SARS-CoV-2. So when we talk about the virus, uh, they call it COVID-19, that isn't correct. The name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. And you can think of it like HIV AIDS. The virus is human immunodeficiency virus, which causes uh, the disease acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So the virus that causes COVID-19 disease is SARS-CoV-2, which is a close relative to the virus SARS-CoV, which caused the 2003 SARS epidemic. So having done that, now let me just tell you a little bit about uh, viruses in general. And I'll just say that viruses, it's important to remember uh, that viruses are incapable of replicating without a host cell. You know, viruses in their simplest form are an outer coat, you know, a package which surrounds uh, the nucleic acid, the, basically the genome of the virus. And so a virus's objective is really just to get into the cell so it infects, replicates, make lots of new copies of itself, get out of the cell and spread to a new host. That's essentially the life cycle of the virus and that's what this virus does. Well, thank you, Craig. Um, moving to you, Kirsten, epidemiologists um, track public health outbreaks. I'm sure you do a lot more than that, that's, but that's certainly one of the things you do. Can you, can you just address, is there anything unique or notable about COVID-19 um, that makes it different from other outbreaks? Thank you. Well, the most unique thing about COVID-19 is it's an entirely new entity, and this creates challenges in taking the first steps in investigating an outbreak. For instance, in their learning from SARS, the Chinese had in place since 2002 a surveillance protocol to pick up pneumonias of unknown origin. What we know about COVID-19 is still shifting, but up to 80% of persons who've tested positive for COVID-19 may be symptomatic. 
So using this protocol that the Chinese put in place, only severe cases of COVID-19 would have been detected early. The first cases may have occurred in China as early as November. We really became aware of it in January and the World Health Organization declared it a pandemic on March 11. A pandemic is an epidemic that occurs over a wide geographic area and affects a large proportion of the population. There's no clear line that says now we've got an epidemic and now we've got a pandemic. This is the first pandemic that has been caused by a coronavirus. And, and just on that, I, I know the, the WHO has received some, uh, some criticism for not leaping into the fray and uh, declaring a pandemic, pandemic sooner, although they did declare a, a health emergency, and I guess that was the real wake-up call. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the challenge is that there's not a set of numbers that say, today this is a pandemic and now we have three more cases in X more countries and, and now, sorry, an epidemic and now it's a pandemic. There isn't a line in the sand that one crosses that's really black and white. Hmm. Well, uh, thank you. Um, and you both provided, um, that's a really useful context for our audience submitted questions, uh, which are coming up now, because we've received a lot of those questions and we tried to combine them into the few most asked ones. And here's the first one, and maybe Craig, I'll go to you first. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about creating a vaccine. Um, how does one go about creating a vaccine and why the heck does it take so long? Okay. That's a great question. And, and so you've probably heard uh, on reports saying it'll take between 12 and 18 months. And you may think, wow, that's a, a long time to create a vaccine. But if we actually hit that target of 18 months, that would be the fastest vaccine that was ever created. Okay. So why does it take so long to create a vaccine? There's a couple of reasons. Um, the first is actually what the vaccine is trying to do. And I'll get a slight bit technical here, but um, your immune system, because it's all about the immune system, your immune system has, there's what's called the adaptive immune response. And again, I'm not going to get too technical, but that means when you see a pathogen once, your adaptive immune system recognizes it and remembers it. And the next time you see that pathogen, you have a very fast, very strong response and you don't get sick from the virus or the pathogen. There's two ways you can get your adaptive immune response working. One is through just getting sick with the pathogen, recovering, and then you have long-term memory, uh, but you show clinical symptoms of the disease. The other way is to vaccinate, which gives your body the, the imprint of the pathogen without creating disease. Now, so to create that vaccine, there are two arms, if you will, of the adaptive immune response. Everybody thinks about antibodies, but there's also T cells. And each virus responds, uh, or the immune system responds differently to different pathogens. And so when you're creating a vaccine, you have to create a vaccine not only that, that elicits immunity, but it has to do the right type of immunity. Otherwise, it won't work on the virus. In addition, there are different parts of the virus that need to be, that might, that the, the immune system might be able to recognize, but that don't actually neutralize the virus. So you need to get the right type of immunity to the right portions of the virus to create a good vaccine. So that's the research part of developing a vaccine and that takes time. Then once we have a vaccine and we wanna try it, we need to test it in humans. And we're testing for two things. We need a vaccine that's safe and effective. So you need both of those for a vaccine to be, uh, to, to, be to work. And so you've heard about the clinical trials. We have phase one through three clinical trials. In each of those steps of the clinical trials can take months to collect the data, uh, analyze the data, and decide again whether or not the vaccine is safe and effective. And then the final stage is manufacturing. And to go up from making sort of thousands of doses to tens of millions or hundreds of millions of doses is not a trivial manufacturing uh, process. For example, even with the influenza, the seasonal flu va vaccine that is available each year, it takes about six months to manufacture that vaccine. 
So if each of these three steps, the development of the vaccine, the testing of the vaccine, and then the manufacturing goes smoothly, you're looking at around 18 months. You know, if any one of those processes doesn't go well, the, the process can take a lot longer. So that's why the process can take so long to create a vaccine. One of the things that is coming up too is that there's very little that we know about herd immunity and COVID-19. You're certainly seeing um, different studies showing that the time it takes to be, develop immunity and, and how long it might last. And there are some experts who have doubts that we even should be pursuing a herd immunity approach and argue that the real solution now is the vaccine. And the one thing too on the vaccine side is, you know, it's not a slam dunk that we're gonna be able to create one. You know, it's fairly easy now to create say an influenza vaccine, but also remember that scientists have been trying for over 20 years to create a vaccine against human immunodeficiency virus, and we still don't have a vaccine. And that's probably because we don't have the right type of immunity and the right type of targets. So we don't know where this vaccine is going to land because as Kirsten said, a lot of this is, is, is new for coronaviruses in terms of developing therapeutics and treatments for humans. Well, as a follow-up to that, um, if we're talking 18 months or maybe it could be 20 years before we get a vaccine, in the meantime, um, I mean, there are things when you have the, the flu um, that there's antiviral medicines like a Tamiflu, if, if I'm using the terminology correctly, that can, they don't solve the flu, but they do uh, help reduce the impact of it. Is, is there anything like that either on the horizon? And indeed, and, and this may be a silly question, but th does something like Tamiflu, would that help with COVID-19? I'll, I'll start and maybe Kirsten will jump in. Uh, a lot of the antivirals are specific to a particular class of, of viruses. So Tamiflu wouldn't work against uh, a coronavirus. There are some encouraging signs that some existing antiviral drugs are showing some promise in treating uh, COVID-19 disease. So remdesivir, for example, there's some interesting observations coming out, but we don't have the whole story yet. So it's hard to know whether or not it will ultimately be effective. But scientists are trying all sorts of different antivirals and other types of drugs to see what might fill the gap if a vaccine isn't available. Great. Well, thank you. Um, now we've got lots of questions, so I'll just uh, move along. Um, it may be, Kirsten, this is for you. Um, ICU, intensive care admissions across Ontario, uh, where we're located, um, seem to be uh, significantly lower than the original modeling had projected. So that's one thing. But the overall deaths in Ontario are higher than projected. Can, can you explain what's going on? Okay. Well, modeling obviously is a very important part of planning for healthcare needs and determining potential outcomes. But there, as we keep saying, are a lot of unknowns about COVID-19. And so the models are only as accurate as the knowledge we have about the virus and about how people respond to measures that are put into place. Uh, federal public health models in early April predicted an upper limit of 700 deaths in Canada, but there have been more like 1,700 deaths, so their prediction fell short. In Ontario, there actually have been far fewer deaths than were predicted in an earlier model. The number of deaths is being driven, as we hear in the media, by outbreaks in long-term care facilities. In Ontario, this accounts for about 40% of the mortality in the province. And in Quebec, that's about as high as 70% of the mortality in the province. In general, and again, as I'm sure we all know, it's the elderly who experience the severe outcomes of the virus, including respiratory failure. Some patients are actually choosing not to receive intensive care, including ICUs or respiratory support, or what people call ventilators. And this is particularly true for persons who choose to die, for instance, in their long-term care home, and may be part of the reason that we are seeing fewer ICU admissions. Well, th well thank you for that. And, and we can just hope that the, the trend to uh, fewer ICU admissions uh, carries on and that we really are plateauing right now. Um, 
here's uh, here's a question. What happens um, when it, let's say you do get COVID nineteen? And I know probably a lot of us are sitting at home and and we might cough or we might sneeze and we think, oh my God, do I do I have it? Um, but what happens if the worst happens and we do realize that we have it, uh, but we're staying at home? Are there home treatments that, that we can use to uh, help recover? Um, should we treat it like a cold, like drinking plenty of fluids and rest and over-the-counter cough and cold medicine? Um, or is there, is there a better thing to do? Well, I think as Craig's made quite clear, there's really no known effective treatment at this time, although um, we've re there are lots of trials that are now underway. Overall, the care for COVID-19 at home is similar to that for influenza, and we're all familiar with that. In most people, the symptoms will last a few days, and people will often feel better after about a week. Acetaminophen, Tylenol, may help with symptoms, and just like influenza, it's really important to drink a lot of fluids and get rest. I think the really important thing about caring for COVID-19 at home is that there is a need to watch for warning signs. And there are, these are particularly our difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, newish confusion or ability, inability to wake up, and bluish lips or face. And so they, those are things that we don't necessarily watch for when we have a family member with influenza. Another really important aspect that maybe we treat differently with COVID-19 is the need to protect other members of the household, including things like frequent hand washing, surface disinfection, and the using of masks during care. And if you do have a home member, I recommend a member with, of your family with COVID-19, I recommend you also go on to the Government of Canada website and access the pamphlet called How to Care for a Person with COVID-19 at Home, Advice for Caregivers. And uh, this pamphlet or this booklet um, addresses the personal safety aspects of caring for someone at home with COVID-19. So it's the same, and yet it is also a little bit different, particularly if you have um, someone with COVID-19 at home and you have an elderly family member, for instance, who also lives uh, in that same home is that there's a need for level of caution and there's also a need to watch for those warning signs where you need to to get access to healthcare outside the home. Now, a, a follow-up maybe for Craig, uh, because one thing I gather that doesn't work is things like antibiotics. And I think that's because uh, this is a virus and it's not a bacteria. Now, maybe briefly, what is the difference? I mean, my mother and probably most of our mothers um, talked about germs and it was sort of germs are bad. I don't know whether germs are bad. And I, and I assume that uh, there's bacteria and their virus are really germs and maybe there's something else. But anyway, uh, what is the difference? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, bacteria, if get a somewhat philosophical are living organisms. They are able to replicate on their own uh, and they're able to carry out all processes of a living organism. And because of that, there are lots of different targets that um, antibiotics, things that affect bacteria will work on. And bacteria are very distinct from, their processes are very distinct from say humans, if we focus on that. A virus is really a non-living thing. It can't replicate on its own. So it needs to get, find a cell to infect. And once it infects that cell, it can carry out its replication. So there is very limited targets that we have in a viral infection because most of the, the processes that the virus is using are our actual cellular processes. They're our own body is actually replicating this virus for us. So whereas an antibiotic, we can actually target something separate from us, an antiviral has to sort of target something that's within us, if you will, and using our own machinery against us. So there, there is antibiotics will have no effect on a virus, and there are very limited antivirals because you have to find a drug that will affect the virus but won't harm the host, that is you. So they're very, very different in terms of the biology and how we would treat those diseases. 
Well, and uh, and you've talked about hosts, and, and when we have COVID-19, we are the host. But one of the questions that has uh, come up fairly frequently relates to how this all started. And there's conspiracy theories out there that it was secretly started uh, you know, by the Chinese in a lab, or if you're Chinese, there's conspiracy theories that it was started by a, a you know, a U.S. government somewhere, or the Illuminati, or, but we think in reality that it started with an animal, probably a bat. Um, so, how does it how does it jump from a bat or other animal to a human? That doesn't happen all the time, does it? It's a great question. I, I don't know if we actually truly know the answer to that. And I'll explain a little bit, but, um, and I think over the coming months and years, we will understand very well how this virus moved from presumably a bat to a human, uh, but whether or not there was an intermediate host in there is, is the question. The way it would work is that, uh, you know, a human would come into contact with the virus and might become infected. And this may happen more often than we think, but most of the time these are dead end infections. So you may or may not get, uh, uh, inf the virus may actually take hold, but it doesn't spread. And so it's kind of, it doesn't go anywhere. Every once in a while, a human might get infected by a virus, which might have limited ability to spread among humans. You can think about things like Ebola virus, for example, or the SARS outbreak in 2003. Those were viruses that came from animals into humans, but the virus didn't replicate very well, didn't spread very well, and so it never became a pandemic. Um, so that's the next step that, uh, that can happen. The final step is that maybe a virus moves from an animal to a human, and it's not adapted to the human, but it gains mutations. It changes over time. It becomes much easier for the virus. It becomes adapted to spreading in humans. And that's where we're at now. And there's been some interesting research that's looked at, you know, where did this virus come from? And, and some suggest that it emerged in November, December, 2019. Others are suggesting that the virus may actually have been in humans for months or years before that, slowly adapting to humans until it acquired the right set of mutations that allowed it to spread really easily from one human to another. So this is one of those questions specific to this virus. I think we're going to learn a lot about how viruses move from an animal into an adapt and into a human. Uh, we'll see that coming out over the next few months and years as, as we study this. It, it, fascinating. There's just so much to know. And we're, we're all watching so much television and learning so much. And it seems like there's so much more that uh, that we don't know as the general public, but uh, researchers and, and people like yourselves um, are still finding out. Um, it, there are more questions, but we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I do want to ask uh, one question which had come up uh, a good deal really is what is going to happen over the next few months? And maybe Kirsten, you could, uh, you could answer this. Um, are we in fact flattening the curve? And we think maybe BC is flattening the curve. Maybe Ontario is, doesn't look like Quebec is. Um, yeah, so where, where are we? And, 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 and other than physical distancing, is there anything more we can be doing to try and, and, and stop the spread? So Ontario re released new modeling data this week, and, and what they're telling us is that the peak of cases is occurring right now, whereas in their earlier models, they thought the peak would occur in May, so that's good for us. The curve has flattened in Ontario and in Canada overall. The present situation looks more like the predicted best case scenarios. Unfortunately, we have two separate disease processes going on. So community transmission is declining, is going down, but the spread of the virus within communal living facilities, such as long-term care homes, is actually on the rise. The question of when restrictions are going to be lifted, and I think we're all asking that one, is a very difficult one. Last week, the World Health Organization issued some guidelines for lifting restrictions. And there are six uh, sort of areas that need to be covered. Of the six areas, Canada has met or is close to meeting two of them. And those are managing the import of cases from other Canada countries, 
and educating the population to a new norm, although we know that's variable. We still need to do things like increase the, the amount of testing that's being done, increase contact tracing, minimize outbreaks in facilities such as long-term care homes, put measures in place in workplaces and in schools to prevent spread before, according to the, the World Health Organization, we are ready to lift restrictions. My wild guess, and I'm sure that we all have different guesses, is that restrictions are likely to be lifted in stages. So in BC, where they've been really successful in flattening this, the curve, they estimate that their interpersonal contact is now about 30% of what it would normally have been. They figure that if contacts rose between, so they lifted restrictions such that contacts rose to between 60 and 40% of normal, then they might actually maintain their hospitalizations relatively stably, but that if they go much above that 60%, they're likely to have a new new outbreak. And so that's the kind of, of guessing game that we're in at the moment. Well, and uh, and you talk about BC as an area and, and uh, Trent University has alumni all over the world. And I guess what you're saying is that maybe different regions um, will uh, respond in different ways. The curve may be flattening in some countries of the world or some provinces, and they may be able to ease restrictions. Um, sooner than other areas, but doesn't that raise a danger that somebody travels from one area to another and then, then we're back at the beginning? And notice that one of the things in the World Health Organization guideline is the, the ability to restrict the, the import of new cases of COVID. So travel is a very important part of it. And it'll be interesting in the coming weeks as we see the conversation in the American media um, and the push to, to lift restrictions and I realize there's some danger for Canada in that, but if we can manage to maintain our border, it will be very interesting to see um, what the impact of that is in the United States and hopefully learn from that. Well, thank you. And one final question, because we do need to, to wrap up, but to both of you, I'll go to you first, Craig. Um, let's leave on a positive note. What are the positive takeaways and lessons uh, that we can take forward from from what's happening now. Yeah, what I'm hoping is actually that that this is a great opportunity actually for for people to watch science in action. Really, um, you know, the general public may not actually understand how science works and how we tackle questions. And so, while the eyes of the world are focused on the pandemic, you can see how the science will evolve because it will change. What we think, you know, a month ago will be different than what we think in, in a month from now. And to watch the discoveries and breakthroughs as they happen, because really the way out of this pandemic is going to be through science. So it'll be the development of vaccines, hopefully, the development of antiviral drugs to treat disease. It'll be developing, as Kirsten said, models. Uh, and the models aren't great right now because we make lots of assumptions. And so getting better data will allow us to create better models that will allow us to help manage the disease as we move out from these, uh, you know, from the social isolation. It also includes understanding the origins of the disease and how to prevent future disease outbreaks like this. So I think that that's uh, something that will, will be really interesting for people to watch. Well, thanks. And Kirsten, have you got a message of a glimmer of hope for us? Well, I guess a, a down and an up, and not dissimilar to Craig, but um, not surprising, it's not dissimilar to Craig. So you know, SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 viruses have all emerged since 2002, and one writer has stated that in evolutionary terms, that's really microseconds. Obviously, the risk of these occurrences has accelerated, and it's been fascinating for me to watch the research response to this. Vaccine research, clinical trials of therapies, epidemiological studies have been initiated in much shorter periods than and I think any of us would have thought possible. I mean, think about it. It's been less than four months since we learned about COVID-19. We've made massive changes in the way we're living in order to flatten cur the curve, and we've been successful at this. All of this has been impressive and suggests to me that we have the capacity as a country and globally to meet the challenges of these new viruses and to come out the other end knowing more about the disease, but also more about ourselves and our capacity to manage change. Well, thank you. I, I feel a little bit better already. And uh, thank you both again for your time. And 
to everyone out there. Um, please be sure to join us next week as we discuss learning from home during a pandemic, uh, tips, tricks, myths, and magic with Trent University School of Education faculty, Dr. Denise Hedlarski and Dean, Dr. Kathy Bruce. And uh, you can submit questions for next week's topic and indeed uh, comments and questions in general using the hashtag uh, Trent Talks. Please stay safe and always remember that you are not alone. When this is over, and at some point it will be over, if we continue to all pull together exactly in the way we are already pulling together, the new normal could be significantly better than the old one. Thank you all, and I hope to see you next week.